our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 9, if you will. Matthew, chapter 9. And let me call your attention to one verse there, Matthew 9, verse 9. It says, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. The receipt of custom would be some official post or some location where the publicans or the tax collectors would do their business, uh, conduct their business. Uh, notice the reputation of these men there in verse 10. And it came to pass, as Jesus said at meet in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. They were lumped together with society's worst. A publican at that time was a Jew who got paid to collect taxes from his fellow Jews on behalf of Rome. And people hated them, naturally. Turn over to chapter 10. Verses 2 and 3. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, that's Peter, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, verse 4, Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Today, we're going to begin a verse-by-verse -verse study of the gospel according to Matthew. This idea came to me as I was doing my own reading at home about a week ago, maybe a week and a half ago. I thought, I think Matthew will be a good book for us to take up next. And I don't know that I've ever tried to teach the book of Matthew. If I did, it was years ago and I was probably out of my depth. But we're going to trust God that that's not the case and God teaches us some important things along the way. Uh, the book of Matthew, here's the cold facts, has 28 chapters, <clears throat> 1,071 verses, 23,684 words in the authorized text. There may be something about those numbers yet to be revealed to men. And this first book in the New Testament introduces the reader to the coming of Christ, which means the Messiah, to the nation of Israel. And it has such a Jewish tone to it, uh, there can be no doubt about the intention of the author. Uh, it's written from the standpoint of an Old Testament Hebrew who has been anxiously waiting for the Messiah to appear. Uh, the date of its writing, and this is approximate, between 64 and 66 A.D. And I say approximate because sometimes setting historical dates for written documents is more difficult than setting a date for some outward event. Matthew is placed first in the New Testament as the, as the logical link between the close of the Old Testament, Malachi in our Bible, and the events that are about to take place at the first coming of the Lord Jesus. Matthew's Gospel serves as a bridge from God's dealings through the nation of Israel and 39 Hebrew books of the Old Testament and now his attention on the uh, church which is going to be composed of both Jews and Gentiles by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a transition book in the Bible. And before we jump in, uh, I want you to turn forward to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. And let me read verses 13 through 18. Acts 15 verses 13 
through 18. And after they held, had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, that's Peter, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And you see that in Peter's ministry back in Acts chapter 10, the house of Cornelius, the Roman centurion. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God, are all his works from the beginning of the world. The Gospel according to Matthew connects God's attention to the Jews with his attention now to both Jews and Gentiles. Bible critics say that perhaps multiple authors were responsible for what we read in the book of Matthew and therefore it can't be believed entirely. They say that since the language of that day was presumably Aramaic all the time, which is sort of a hybrid Hebrew language, that the things translated from Greek into English may probably, are, are probably unreliable. And, but they've never produced an Aramaic copy of Matthew that would precede any Greek copies of Matthew that have ever been given to us by God. And the reason they would do something like this is uh, look forward at Matthew chapter 16. Here's one good reason why someone would insist that the translation of Matthew we have in front of us is unreliable. Matthew 16, verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Catholic Church's argument is that in the Aramaic language, the word for Peter was clearly a solid, sound, giant rock, like a rock edifice, uh, a foundation stone on which something solid could be built. And therefore, they argue that Peter was naturally the rock the church was going to be founded on if you consider what the Aramaic language would have said. And so they insist that we have to go to an Aramaic translation or copy of the New Testament, which has never been found, never been produced, in order to right, rightly understand it. The devil will go to any lengths he can to undermine the authority of the book you're holding in your hands if he can use it to make Peter the first pope. He'll corrupt the entire, an entire book of the Bible just for the sake of justifying that idea. In one verse, these are the lengths Satan will go to to undermine the, the authority of the Bible and to teach something that's false. But since we're Bible believers, we really don't care what the Hebrew or the Greek or the Aramaic or the Pig Latin manuscripts say about the book of Matthew. What does the language of the common man say? That's what we care about. We're English speakers, aren't we? So what does the Bible in English say to us? And if God's able to produce a book for the, in the language of every man as he needs it, uh, then God, who is infinite in knowledge, is able to make it perfect for every man. The theme of Matthew's Gospel is to present the Lord Jesus as the rightful Messiah to the nation of Israel. That is how he is portrayed throughout Matthew's Gospel. All right, let's begin verse 1. Matthew 1, verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The book of Matthew introduces the Messiah, or the Messiah's lineage, let me say, from Abraham down through Joseph. 
It's also the second time someone is introduced with the words, the book of the generations of. I think I mentioned this last week when we were studying the fruit of the garden, between the comparisons between Christ and Adam in the Bible. Um, the other person who has that introduction was Adam, Genesis 5, verse 1. One man's sin brought death to the world. Another man's death brings deliverance from sin. Think about it that way. Verse 1 also gives us insight into the use of the word son. Let me read it again. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The word son in the Bible can be a great, 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 great grandson, a descendant of someone. It's used in that sense. It can be a son-in-law of someone else, as Saul used it towards David. 1 Samuel 18, verse 21, and 1 Samuel 24, verse 16. And undoubtedly, it's used that way of Joseph over in Luke 3, verse 23. The word son can certainly apply to an adopted son. In the case of Christ's relationship to Joseph, as we study the rest of Matthew 1. And sometimes we even use the word son as an honorific uh, from an older man to a younger man. You know, son, when I was your age, we had to actually turn the complete dial to dial a telephone call. We had to create sparks inside there to get someone else. Verse 2. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Genealogy descriptions are fairly self-explanatory. However, the spelling Judas, J-U-D-A-S, is a transliteration from Judah, J-U-D-A-H, in the Old Testament, to go from Hebrew into Greek and then from Greek into English sometimes requires spellings to be modified. And the phrase, and his brethren, shows Matthew's intention to single out the tribe of Judah as the tribe from which the Messiah was expected to come. Go back, if you will, to Genesis 49. And I don't know how long we're going to go today. This is just introduction to this book. We may finish a little early, but you won't hold that against me. Genesis 49. Notice there verse 8. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Well, there's all kinds of symbolic reference to the Lord Jesus Christ reigning. He's going to put his uh, hand in the neck of his enemies. Christ is going to destroy the man of sin and the son of perdition and all those who worship the Antichrist and all those who were the enemies of Israel. Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, which another prophetic name for the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Verse 3 in our text. And Judas begat Phares. That's spelled P-H-A-R-E-Z in Genesis 38, verse 29. And Zerah, spelled Z-A-R-A-H, Genesis 38, also spelled Z-E-R-A-H in 1 Chronicles chapter 2. Of Thamar, spelled Tamar, T A M A R, without the H, Genesis 38. And Phares begat Esram. Esram is later or earlier found to be spelled Hezron, H E Z R O N, in the book of Ruth, chapter 4, verse 18. But the changes in spellings shouldn't throw off or confuse. Uh, the Bible believer. 
That's just part of going from one language into another. For example, the name John comes out as Juan in Spanish. It comes out as Johan in German, Ian in Ireland and Scottish, and uh, Ivan in Russian. So many different spellings to the name John. Think of the variations of the word Mary, the name Mary. Miriam in the Old Testament, Mary in the New Testament, Maria, Marie, Anne Marie, Mary Anne, and so forth. And they vary from society to society and language to language. Also notice when Thamar first shows up, Genesis 38, verse 6, the implication is that she's a Canaanite, not descended from Abraham. And the idea is even more probable when you discover that later Rahab the harlot, who was an Amorite, and Ruth, who was a Moabite, Bathsheba, who was a Hittite, uh, and Rehoboam's mother, who was an Ammonite, are all involved in Christ's genealogy as we continue. Verse 4, And Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Naasun, and Naasun begat Salmon. That's more of the same spelling changes. Aram is spelled simply Ram, R-A-M, in Ruth chapter 4. Naasun is spelled N-A-H-S-H-O-N in the Old Testament. Nashon, he received special mention in the Bible. He was listed among the military leaders of Israel. Numbers chapter 1, verse 7. And he was called a prince of the children of Judah in 1 Chronicles chapter 2. Now, as I say, I didn't know how long our material was going to last today, but this is simply introduction. Matthew and Acts and Hebrews are three deadly books in the Bible. They cause people more trouble. They present more stumbling blocks, more challenges to someone to read the Bible and rightly divide it and understand it than any other books in all the 66. I think we touched on some of those um, obstacles during our study of the book of Hebrews. And likewise in the book of Acts. All three of those, particularly Matthew and Acts, are transitional in their theme and in their emphasis. And so you can't fix one certain doctrine based on something the Lord Jesus said in his earthly ministry, particularly, or his Sermon on the Mount, if it doesn't match what God revealed to the Apostle Paul later to all the churches. Because, remember this, before the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, his apostles, and everyone else were still living in Old Testament times. The plan of salvation given to the nation of Israel was still obedience to the commandments and the law. The Lord Jesus came and his death satisfied everything all those animals before had only symbolized. It fulfilled that. Therefore, no longer any need to sacrifice animals when you sin. The perfect sacrifice was now rendered. It had now been carried out before God. And so God's dealings with men, whosoever will, change. And so the emphasis of Matthew is to show God's attention to the nation of Israel now being turned and eventually to Jew and Gentile alike. We'll get to that as we go, as the weeks and months unfold, Lord willing.